All right. Hello, everyone. Greg Staley here from Diverge Media. We are excited to bring this next interview to you. It's more of a panel discussion about an independent Canadian film that is going to be coming out here in October of this year. Uh, it's called Ace and the Scout, celebrating history of two Canadian uh, World War I heroes, really. We have Keenan Keisha, who is playing Pega Megabo. Right. I, I know I got that wrong, so correct me when you come in. We have Julian Sagan. He plays a soldier in the film. And we have producer and writer of the film, Aaron Huggett. And we are going to be joined by a Diverge Media contributor, Jillian Davis, to discuss. So just hold with me as I bring in everyone here. All right, welcome aboard, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm really excited about this film because I've been kind of following the production since the Indiegogo fundraiser back in, I believe it was the fall of 2019, whenever that was started. Um, and it, it, it was a great story and a fascinating one to me because a lot of times whenever we talk about the heroes and history of Canada, there's a lot of, particularly these days, a lot of kind of shade thrown on it. But this is just an amazing story of two um, Canadian heroes from two different backgrounds. One is the flying ace, Billy Bishop, and the other one is the lesser known Indigenous, like the, the most decorated Indigenous soldier in Canadian history, Francis Pegham Magabo, who very few people know about. So I'm interested in, first of all, maybe um, starting with the, the inspiration for the story and Aaron, what made you decide to write on this story and bring this to life? Yeah, so, you know, this is our uh, our fourth true history film. And uh, one of the things that we look for are pieces of Canadian history that are being lost. And there are so many of them out there. When you, when you look at the way that U.S. history has been told over and over again in films and TV shows, I, I think stories like that of Francis Pagan Magabo and Billy Bishop, um, it's got a different place in Canadian lore than it would in other places in the world. And, and especially in Peggy's case, it, it's just not known. He hasn't, he hasn't gained the, uh, the wide awareness that, that really he deserves. And the big thing that appealed to me about telling his story was, um, you know, when we look at the way that Canadian history has been told, uh, over the last century, often it's, uh, it, it's not really true to what, what occurred. It, it, it's pretty sanitized and, um, often, you know, kind of government funded, right? And, and, and that can have its own uh, way of creating bias in the way the story is told and the way that characters are portrayed. And, uh, and, and Pecky, you know, I, I, I mean this when I say it, that it, if he was, um, you know, kind of a Caucasian American, everyone would know who he is. And, and because he's um, Canadian and indigenous, it's a story that's, uh, that's kind of a best kept secret. And we felt it was time to let it out. And it's an amazing story. I mean, that's the thing that that um, really struck me about this is that he is still known as the third most deadly sniper in history with 378 confirmed kills, I believe. And, and uh, 300 prisoners that he captured as well. And so, uh, sorry not to interrupt, but it, it's like that. that's a really exciting piece of his character that he wasn't just this person that was out there and kind of ruthlessly trying to rack up numbers, right? And and uh, and, and I think that that's any time that he's been talked about, there, there's a bit of an air of that in his story. But that that's really not who he was. You know, he was somebody who would, um, if he had the opportunity to to kind of peacefully capture the enemy and neutralize them that way, take away the danger to himself and and his uh, his band of brothers, uh, he he was happy to do that. And and so just a unique character. And, and the other thing that was really fascinating is the lore around him and how he apparently would go into enemy trenches and take trophies from sleeping German soldiers and stand around and listen to conversations of the Germans as well without them even knowing he was there. Yeah, it's uh, when I first started researching Pega Magabo about five years ago, um, it, it was uncanny how charismatic this guy was, not just effective, uh, but he uh, he just had this way of um, fearlessly doing what needed to be done. And so that gave me this sort of impression, impression of him that he was kind of, um, I, I guess, more like militant or, or more like what we would picture from modern Marines. And, and so 
initially the screenplay was kind of taking that direction and and i connected with dr brian mckinnis who's um a, a grandson of francis peggy mcgabo and uh, he actually wrote an auto uh, or a biography on on peggy because i wanted to get a sense of if i was capturing him accurately if this was the way that his family and his community uh, knew him to be and um Brian was really uh, an amazing resource to have during that phase. And he he was an advisor on the film, you know, kind of all the way through developing the screenplay and research. And and even when we were in the casting process for for uh, for Peggy and uh, and, and still. Um, but what he what he said to me was, well, that that's not really Peggy. Like he he had the ability to um, be highly effective and be highly focused in those pieces. But that, that's the natural part from, you know, growing up hunting and um, g growing up kind of in, in uh, this wilderness area outside of Perry Sound a lot. And, you know, a hundred years ago, it's a different time. That piece was just built in over time. And the, the thing that people didn't, don't realize is he had this amazing sense of humor. He was he was a prankster and a practical joker. And like he would stick things in new um, new soldiers to the front lines boots and and just you know get them to panic when they put it on their feet and things and um, just a totally other side of him than maybe we had seen in history and um, when Keenan and I were discussing the character after he was cast we you know that was one of the things that we talked about we've got to make sure we capture this right because if he just seems like this like ruthless soldier it's doing him an injustice and, and to portray him accurately it's got to have this human side to him where he you know he he's a person uh, who who was effective but at the same point um you know enjoyed himself in between those those heightened moments and found ways to keep things light for for his uh for his band of brothers that he was serving with in the trench and uh, I just that to portray that kind of a character and get those two facets of his personality I just want to let you know, Keenan. I have you muted. There's a bit of background noise, so when you want to interject, just unmute yourself, and then yeah, you'll be free to speak. Yeah, sorry. I'm actually I'm at a Medewa Wind ceremonies right now in the background, so there's a there's a bit of background noise because I am um, out here on the land um, at a place of our learning right now. Um, but I am taking this time away so that I can I can speak for and, and talk about Francis. Ryan McGinnis is actually here too. He's actually here at ceremonies with us. Um, so, but yeah, just, uh, just let me know. Uh, I don't know if you want me to continue or if you want me to answer any questions. That'd be that'd be great. Just well, if you can give us kind of a synopsis of how you developed the character and how you stayed true to the different aspects of his personality. So <clears throat> when when I was uh, casted for Francis Pagmagabo, um, one of the first things I did was read Brian McGinnis's book, and I read about who he was as a person. But also I took uh, some of the stories that I heard about him, and I talked to a lot of, uh, like, I grew up in Perry Sound. I went to high school there, and it was very close to where Francis was, and I also grew up in Shawanaga. So I, I also hunted and fished, um, Grew up learning how to fish and hunt where Francis grew up hunting and fishing as well. So the character kind of just felt more natural um, to me than anything to kind of just take on this role. However, like I have never served in the armed forces. Um, so that was a big part of, of learning stuff, like a learning curve for me um, to try and portray that part. But it's something that I always wanted to do um, as, a, as a youth growing up to portray something uh, someone who would be a role model to our youth, um, especially for Indigenous communities, um, but also for other people around the world um, who look up to Francis and who know about him. And I just wanted to help spread this uh, and honor him in this way. That's a, a beautiful thing to be able to do that. And, and I just want to um, congratulate you on, on just such a beautiful film and a beautiful way of tributing this amazing individual of our history. So, and then who is Robert in the story? Uh, well, Robert is, I suppose, what many young Canadians were when they first signed up to join in this war. Um, they thought they were going off on this grand adventure. You know, maybe they'd become heroes and, you know, see more of the world. 
And mm -hmm. when they realized the horror that they were in, that they, they had to adapt, you know, to their surroundings. Mm -hmm. And sadly, Robert is one of the soldiers who wasn't able to do that. He wanted to stay lost in the fantasy. He wanted to escape, uh, you know, to the skies where he could see his idol, Billy Bishop, the uh, other hero mentioned in this war. Mm -hmm. And sadly, you know, he can't do that because he's stuck on the ground in the mud and the blood. And I guess it's too much for him. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we, um, you know, as independent filmmakers, it, it's challenging making films in general, uh, but making a war film, actually, one of the things that, and it was the tipping point for us to go after this one um, back in 2019, when we kind of greenlit it, was uh, somebody told us it was impossible. And so we were like, well, you know, that's, you, you said it the wrong way. Like, we're going after it for sure now. And um, it, I think they might have been right in hindsight, but uh, or nearly. But uh, war films are difficult. Indie films are difficult in general. War films are extremely difficult because there's a multiplier and everything. And everything has to be as close to historically accurate as we can. And so um, one of the early decisions we had to make was, you know, there's, it, there, there's certainly no way that we could tell a holistic story about the First World War with context. And, you know, it would be hundreds of millions of dollars to do a film like that or to do a series like that. And if we tried to squeeze that into 90 minutes, we wouldn't do it justice. But what we saw was there, you know, within the um, the second uh, the second Battle of Arras and the Battle of the Scarp, it, it, at the beginning of the Hundred Days Offensive, there was this moment in Canadian history that was truly unique and was being lost. And what it was was, beginning of the 100 days offensive, the allies were beginning a push where they were going to try to break the German line in several places, get in behind them, and then cut off the Germans front line from resupply. Now, what happened was there was a, a combination of weather and communication problems and and Peggy's battalion being as effective as they were, were the only one that managed to leave on time, break through the German line, take a former position back. But in the time that they did that, the rest of the Allies' uh, offensive uh, was halted, was was ordered to halt, and they weren't they weren't ready to collectively advance as planned. So the impact was this group, this you know small group of Canadian soldiers, found themselves behind the majority of the German line, cut off from resupply, cut off from reinforcement, and forced to survive three days from August 28th to August 30th. And that's where our film primarily takes place, is this kind of Alamo moment in Canadian history where um, this group of soldiers has almost no chance of surviving. And they, some of them know it. You know, the experienced men like um, Peggy Magabo and, and some of the others had been in the thick of it before and, and could tell. They could read the battlefield. They could read their um, commanding officers and know what was what was coming. And um, at that point, it's it's they're just fighting for the man beside them and, and to try to survive the day. And so it's this piece of history kind of between these major offenses that that's little known. And so the question is, can they hold out long enough? Can they stand their ground and hold that line long enough for the rest of the allies force to organize and complete the push that they had planned. And if they do, whoever's still standing when they get there may just survive the day. And if they can't, um, they could easily be overrun by the superior German force with superior defenses and numbers and reinforcements and supply. And um, you look at a moment like that in history and you think, you know, this, this may have happened a thousand times and 999 of them we don't hear about because it ended in massacre, but the Canadians had this secret weapon and uh, Francis Peg and Magabo is, uh, th this is only one of many moments in his military career where he was the difference maker on the battlefield for, for that, for that group that he was fighting with. But it, it is true that Canada barely formed at that time. Um, like just yeah. a brand new country really was still in world war one was part of the British military. It wasn't until world war two that they became their own military and through that process, Canada really came into its own as a, uh, a viable country to be reckoned with, because I, I know that 
um, other countries really looked up to Canada and the way that Canadians fought in those battles. Yeah, it, it, they absolutely did. Canada in World War One gained this reputation of having an uncanny fortitude and and being strong in strategy. And there were several battles where that occurred. Um, when I was doing research for the film, you know, one of the things that we do with all of our history films is to whatever degree is achievable, we'll film it right where the history happened. When we um, made the Red Ryan film, um, he, he's this Canadian um, gangster bank robber from the 30s who died in a shootout with Sarnia, Ontario police in May of 1936. The building's still standing. We were able to secure the third floor and built the set where the, for the where the shootout happened in the same building the history happened. When we made the Donnellys, the Black Donnellys, we went to Lucan, we filmed on the locations that these conflicts happened with the Vigilance Committee in, in many cases. And same with Black Gold, we went to the 1860s oil fields. We knew that wasn't totally possible with this one. We can't pick up 50 people. We're just not that you know scale of a production company. We don't have to deal with that kind of budget. So, but we needed to have a sense of what what it was there. And, and we didn't yet know where are we gonna film this? Where are we gonna do the battlefield? Do these things exist? How do we get planes and tanks and all these things? Um, where do they still exist? So I, I went to, uh, flew into Europe and um, rented a car and my wife and I just drove through Northern France and, and went to all these battlefields. And uh, we, we went to, you know, it was like driving out of civilization, like very much like rural Ontario. Once you get into these, uh, you know, country side parts of Northern France, no one speaks English up there, very few people and uh, had to kind of find our way. And what we were looking for is um, basically we were using trench maps to try to find the exact location that this battle occurred because I wanted to get a sense of what does the land look like and what does it feel like and what is the soil like and what uh, what kind of trees are there and, you know, all these things so we could get it as accurately as possible. And finally, it's like the highway turns into a street and the street turns into a path and the path turns into a dirt path in a farm field. And we find the spot and we're looking around i'm like this looks just like southern ontario like it, it looks like where we're from um and so i live on some acreage and uh we we have a field that looks very much like it we found a place where the tree line matched uh the upton woods tree line uh in the day in 1918 uh rented a mini excavator and built about 250 feet of world war one trench and uh then COVID hit. <laughs> So we've got this trench, it's good old Enniskillen clay just filling with water, you know, all the same problems that the soldiers had in World War One and 100 years later, we're still struggling even with kind of modern engineering and tools and no one shooting at us uh, to, you know, to pull it off. And it just, it, it gave more of a sense of what they actually had to deal with, it, you know, beside just the enemy, um, being in a trench and figuring out a sump and, um, you know, all those struggles. And with COVID, we didn't just have to, you know, maintain the set for, you know, the month of filming. It was like, you know, over a year we were delayed where either um, there were provincial restrictions that, that, that really made it um, kind of unachievable to, to go through with production. And when we finally did, we had to find some creative ways to, you know, to work in some of the, the restrictions that were in place. One was um, it was kind of <clears throat> still highly recommended that, all crew wear masks and you can imagine out there hot you know it's brutally hot you're dealing with pyrotechnics and all these things and uh you know all the crew are in masks and still trying to communicate across the battlefield to set up for the next shot or, or the next take um and so we when we started to get to the crowd scenes we were like okay well, how do we do this and in a way that um follows follows the uh, the requirements and and make sure that we don't put anybody at risk and you know, I think at the, we know things now that we didn't know at the time, right? And um, so we we said, okay, well, they're dealing with the Spanish flu in 1918. That's, um, you know, a huge killer in, in World War I uh, era. And when nurses would come back, they, they would always be wearing masks while they're on mass transit at the time. And uh, a lot of the people that are waiting for others to come back have heard these horror stories about um, the Spanish flu and, and how it's kind of swept through the ranks. And so we, we just looked at it logically and said, well, we can have some of the people waiting at the train station in masks. We can have some of the people at Bishop's recruitment speech in town hall uh, in masks. And it not only fits the ear, it helps communicate the climate of what they're dealing with at the time and how similar it is to some of the things we're dealing with now. 
and I think that's the best way to make sense of kind of some of those COVID era restrictions is it, it's most similar to wartime than, than anything else. The, the, uh, the overarching change uh, that we temporarily had to deal with as a society, as a culture, right? So we just tried to build as much of that in as we could and, and kind of muscle through. And uh, the, these guys, you know, it was definitely a different experience on set maybe than, than other productions, right? Because of dealing with the COVID things. But uh, it, everyone was, you know, amazing to kind of do what needed to be done to, to make the film happen. And it, yeah. it was interesting because the, to get the timeline <clears throat> right here, you were originally supposed to um, start filming in the spring of 2020, which was exactly when we went into the first two weeks of lockdowns. Yeah. And then from there, it was sort of, everybody didn't know what we were dealing with. It was this crazy new thing. And uh, they started bringing in all of the different restrictions, trying to open things up, but couldn't really. So there was all of these almost day to day, you didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, for anybody and let alone trying to do a team project like what a film is. So I can't imagine how frustrating and um, in some ways paralyzing to get things done must have been going through that and trying to figure that out as you went along. Um, if I could just add to that, I think a lot of people from the uh, outside looking in, seeing the film industry, when everything got shut down, there was the uh, you know, you got to keep going and everybody's seen that as a special privilege, but I don't think people understood what that actually shook out to look like on set and how difficult that was, the logistics of it. And so I would love to hear from Keenan and Julian on what was this like as an actor to be in that, trying to be in the right frame of mind for your role. And at the same time, all the COVID background stuff that's going on that has to be dealt with in order to get the shots done. Uh well, I remember when I first realized that COVID was, you know, becoming a more widespread condition, I asked everybody what we were going to do if it did get delayed. Now, we weren't all that concerned. We figured that it would blow over if things would continue on as usual. But as you can see, that didn't happen. So we had to adjust. And when it was time, boy, uh, you know, I don't like wearing masks. It's very hard to breathe in them. Very constricting. So soon as we were done shooting, we'd have to immediately sanitize ourselves, put on new things, get back into our tents. Because the last thing you want is an outbreak on set because who knows how long more that's going to delay things. And that's not just with this movie. That's with every TV show I've worked on as an extra, you know, even, you know, in recent times. Like even now, people still want us wearing masks. Uh, it gave almost a sense of claustrophobia which I suppose is what we'd want to be feeling, you know, during that time, trapped mm -hmm. in those trenches, no space, and uh, always having to be mindful of each other. So, so did it then sort of help you develop your character and, and you were able to use that to kind of um, keep you in character whenever you were working through this? Yeah, yeah, I think it did. I think that especially for my character, <laughs> really was like squeamish about the blood and and just the close and close spaces. Yes, I think that it helped me be more wary of everything. And so are you guys, like when you film your shot and then are separated, you go to your own tent until you're called on again? Is that how this was kind of working just to keep uh, people separate and limit contact kind of thing? Yes, yeah. It, uh, green room. Sorry, uh, I was going to say, yeah, I think um, with COVID and everything, I think it kind of, really set the mood for this era in the 1900s, the beginning. Um, but it also showed a lot of improvements how far we have come as a, as a humanity um, with our with our health restrictions and stuff like that and the care that we're taking and the stuff, the new stuff that we're learning about um, diseases and stuff like that um, and the spread of COVID and how to control stuff like that. Um, for me, I think it was, I actually, I didn't mind it, even though I, th I think it really, I think it helped improve our character, like Julian was saying, um, the claustrophobia that he was speaking of. I think it, it really uh, made us, ourselves self-aware um, the time we were in, but also it kind of, kind of, uh, for me, it put me into like a mood where I was like, tr like picturing myself and not even really having to picture myself, what if there was a world pandemic that was going on at the same time that this war was going on? So I think it was, I thought it was kind of ironic a little bit about how um, history was telling, 
um, tending to repeat itself in that sense. Um, but it also, I think it, um, our set and being able to have that privilege to, to film during this time was definitely something that our, our, our crew, our crew members had really put forward and took the care to do that. And I, I want to thank them for that because that's something that uh, I knew that was, um, that they were able to handle um, in, a, in a really good professional way. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge them for that as well. One of the things that we, we usually really benefit from is kind of a green room space where cast and crew can kind of mingle and has a social aspect. And um, that, that's something that we were really concerned that we would lose with kind of the COVID restrictions and, and having to separate people. Um, and it really impacted the production in, in a couple of different ways. We couldn't have that central green room space. So we, um, we found actually a, a girl guide camp that was closed down and they were selling off all their tents and they're you know these beautiful canvas military style tents so we bought 30 of them and we we had them set up just offset um and each one of those act as kind of a mini green room for a, a team and so every team was made up of three or four people cast or crew they ate together they shared a green room space and for those who were out of town they, they also shared an airbnb so that that was their bubble. And so we created bubbles within the larger team to, to help kind of manage the risk and, and keep people spread out. Um, you know, we keep masks on right up until the point the camera rolls for, for a live take, even rehearsals. Generally, we, we would have masks on talent and, you know, all the, all the precautions, but within film, um, you know, dealing with kind of uh, dealing with hazards and, and dealing with safety issues and concerns is normal. That's Tuesday. You know, like when, when you're doing stunts involving bayonets and pyrotechnics and those kinds of things, um, you know, like the, the people that we're working with as cast members have an amazing capacity for being able to go, okay, I need to do this, this, and this, and they, they're practical requirements to keep myself or others safe. I got to hit my mark. I got to make sure I, I'm on cue. I'm not early because of pyrotechnics or whatever the case we're dealing with blanks and uh, fight choreography and things. So I think for them, they, they already had a skill set for that and, and that they were able to leverage, but certainly took a lot of commitment and kind of some extra energy um, from, from the cast to deal with those restrictions and still be able to, to create these great performances. But like Keenan said, and, and several cast members, um, you know, came back and said this to us, it, the whole COVID situation kind of created an anxiety and a claustrophobia in the trench that they were able to feed off of and use for the performances which is kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, so you were saying that, did you actually film in France? I know that there's pieces that uh, both Ireland and France, there was some filming done. Yeah, so we, we wanted to at least get some of the landscapes in there. So um, we don't have, we, we searched far and wide, we don't have a lot of uh, ruins in Ontario, you know, where things look like they've been shelled out, bombed out. It's just not something that we, typically have there's a little bit uh, there's a little bit of that but it it's pretty clean it's more like a park these days right mm -hmm. so it wasn't available to us and we we felt we needed that especially in the transition coming from southern ontario these new recruits landing in france and seeing seeing the effects of the war that's already been raging on for four years at that point so we filmed that at um these uh ruins at a monastery in in ireland well we we happen to be there and so it's uh glendaloff is is the name of this small community they that's like sheep farmers and this 15th century um monastery it's just gorgeous so we were able to get that northern france was wild um we 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 were at you know upton wood where uh it, it's near this uh place called um Cagnicorp, and uh we, we just stopped at this old church and so there's um th there's uh robert's character uh, or julian's character robert is uh is catholic and so that that's an important piece of his kind of character and identity and, and arc and uh as we're on our way you know just maybe two kilometers or something from uh upton woods uh where orcs trench was we stopped at this catholic church and thought oh that's you know so cool if um it, you know if robert had been moving through the countryside here this may have been the place that he stopped right and uh so we're, we're there and i hear just out of the you know peripherally um a world war one airplane and i was like 
that it, there's no way that we get that lucky. Right. And, and so I, I knew the sound as soon as I heard it, because uh, the year before uh, we, we had been scouting and um, preparing for the, the dogfight scenes in, in Nason the Scout with um, C- Canadian planes and actually filmed. I went up in the back of a SOP with one and a half strutter and filmed a dogfight between a Fokker and an SE5A. And so, so standing there outside this small church in rural northern France. And so I'm like, I got to get my camera. So get finally get the camera set up. And just as we do, a World War One plane flies low over this church. And uh, we're able to get an establishing shot that was just like uncanny that it, it's actually in northern France. And uh, it's in the film. And I couldn't have planned it better. But just <laughs> sometimes you get lucky in the right place at the right time. Serendipity. So, and all of the pyrotechnics, all of the special effects, they were done in the filming in Southern Ontario. Yeah, that's correct. So one of the things that's great about filming in Lambton County is uh, we, you you have uh, a lot of support from the community, a lot of support from kind of local uh, organizations like the fire department. We uh, For Black Donnelly's, we filmed a scene where we had to burn down a barn and, uh, and we were able to get you know, a, a local fire uh, fire team came down and volunteered their time to help us make sure we could do that safely and effectively. And uh, even dealing with pyrotechnics and blanks and that kind of thing, you know, neighbors and and uh, people in the community were were really great about it. We just let them know, hey, this is what we're doing. They kind of know that we do the history films, and uh, and everyone was really good about that. The um, the actual explosions were done by. Um, uh, a guy named James Sled, so he's our special effects supervisor, and 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 again, at the kind of budgets that we typically work with on our films, you don't get guys like James Sled, and uh, but he he had um, he wanted to do a war film, and uh, when our producer Lee Bernier approached him and said, "Hey, you know what? What would be the chances, um, you know, that you'd want to get involved with this, or maybe you know somebody who's kind of starting off that'd be more in our budget range, and could you recommend somebody?" and uh, he said, forget that. I want to do it. And, uh, and kind of did it at a, a lower cost than he typically would and, and fi- found creative solutions to, to give us some big stuff, but, you know, kind of within our budget. And we worked the schedule so that we were able to do the power tactic stuff kind of concentrated around a shorter window of time and then use it throughout the film. And uh, just, just incredible. And, you know, like I, I think about the one scene where um, Julian and uh, Sam and I, um, I was a director of photography as well. Um, we're literally kind of running into these explosions and, and Julie and I were having a conversation that day. Like um, it's not natural, <laughs> you know, like when, when that kind of thing is happening, there's explosions, there's danger. You, your instinct is like, get away from it. Right. But uh, kind of overriding that. And, and we know it's not real or it's, you know, it, it's uh, it, it's a safe version of, of, uh, of these things that these guys dealt with. It's just, um, the amount of fortitude that they needed to have uh, on the front lines was just um, superhuman. Um, on the topic of that, I remember during the charge, there's always this one blast at the end, which knocks both me and uh, Sam, who played the main character, James. It just like we have to fall to the ground there and then we're literally choking up dust or whatever. <laughs> so that actually created this like, atmosphere of us you know recovering from the aftermath and the explosion i actually remember finding it kind of hard to breathe not so much that i was actually in danger but it added to the fear of my character mm-hmm. and so like we're just thinking like oh god i can't see <laughs> properly and i'm thinking uh, i gotta i gotta play this up act even more scared than i actually am right now and so it was both funny and amusing at the same time that, that's some of the challenge too is you know like you, you've got smoke and you've got debris and all these things and specific lines lines that the cast have to run and if you miss it you know there's hazards that are real you know whether it be barbed wire or a pit or whatever the thing is right and so those kinds of rehearsals so our, our stunt coordinator justin moses um and and his team um Kira Trombley and Mike Lariclia and um, all those guys just did an incredible job. Not only was Kira kind of our COVID safety officer and dealing with all of those implications and 
um, and, and the conversations about people are getting used to new norms, um, but all of the regular things as well. And, and in some cases, you know, it's the, the more complex stunts obviously are done by a professional stunt uh, performer, but we're also leveraging cast for kind of some of the, the, the lower impact stunts and they're doing some of their own stunts. Uh, and so being able to uh, train them on set and kind of boot camp it and um, here are the things that you need to do and you need to be aware of. And if you're running with a bayonet, making sure the lines are well understood that you're not running in a, in a path with any other cast and, and creating risk around that. And when do we go with the metal bayonet and when do we need the rubber bayonets? And, you know, and it, it's a, a symphony of, uh, of, of coordination. Um, just great, it gives you great respect for the guys that deal with the real conditions in the battlefield and how, how dangerous it really is. And, and not from just from the obvious things, but all these kind of other uh, dangers created out of the chaos of war. Especially the lantern. Yeah, the lantern was intense. Um, we, we've got this like not, story. <laughs> we, we've got we've got this scene. It, it's called the night raid scene. And so essentially, um, the Canadian forces are running low on ammunition. Um, they formerly held the trench that the Germans are now holding, and some of their caliber ammunition is still in that trench. And so they go on a night raid to slip into the trench to steal some of this ammo back from the Germans, uh, led by Peggy, and. Uh, um, there's this fight that ensues between uh, one of the Canadians, one of the experienced men and a German and, uh, the, the Canadian, um, in the battle loses his weapon and he grabs a kerosene lantern and he hits the German. And when he does, it lights him on fire. And, uh, so it's, it's just those kinds of details where it, again, trying to build the chaos of war into the choreography in a way that feels natural, uh, but it isn't just you know, rifle shot after rifle shot, but, but really trying to showcase kind of this whole um, variety uh, of dangers and, 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 you know, the thousand ways that a soldier can die. Yeah, I think um, all this, all the stunts and the pyrotechnics, uh, the night raid was probably one of my favorite scenes that, um, that we were just talking about here. It was probably that was like probably one of the longest day on sets that we spent there as well. We were there from pretty early in the morning till I don't think I left till about 5 a.m. in the morning um, when we were shooting those scenes for that, that the last day. That's when I wrapped up actually that night or that morning, I guess I should say. But yeah, I think there's a lot of like new stuff that I learned, especially with these stunts, um, working with real blades and some of the fight scenes that were dull. So. Uh, <laughs> It was kind of nerve wracking for myself actually to to be getting um, in some of these fight scenes where I'm using like a real blade and I'm like worried about the other safety of my fellow actors and stuntmen. Um, it just kind of definitely enlightened me to uh, and, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun actually. It was a lot of fun. I, I can't say it was it was it was hard work um, for some of the scenes that we would do because some days I would be in a position for like it felt like all day, but I was there probably for like two and a half hours holding my mark um, in full gear while I, you just probably see me for brief part of the scene uh, from different angles, but I'm there the whole time in real life. So it, it, it definitely um, put a little bit of stress onto my body, but I think that's kind of what was needed as well to kind of experience a little bit of that physical um, afterburn um, after filming all day and then going back to the, back to our Airbnb where there are bubble of actors and actually kind of like waking up the next day and my forearms are just burning from holding this Ross rifle. Um, because it was a real Ross rifle. It, it didn't shoot any, um, any blank ammo um, like other actors had um, with their Enfields. However, I definitely felt the, the weight and the strain on my muscles the next day. But it also, it kind of put me forward into a position where I'm like, okay, this is something that like our, our Canadian soldiers, our, our men and that had to do this all day in the trenches. So. And we got to go home in an Airbnb and like have an actual good rest and water and then go swimming. And after the, after filming, um, these men didn't, didn't get to have that, uh, that luxury to do something like that after just sitting in a trench. And so, uh, as hard as it was, it also like, I don't, I don't see like my, I can't even compare, like compare, like even imagine to compare about what they actually had to go through, um, and during this, this high stress environment, 
um, shells going off. Um, on set, we were watching, I was watching a lot of the explosions go off in the pyrotechnics, and I was just, it was just something to see, and just picturing that continuous barrage that and, and their environment that they had to go through was something that was pretty eye-opening, but it was pretty cool, um, very cool to see firsthand experience of what it might be uh, kind of like, right? So, I mean, we got to stand pretty close to these explosions because we don't have to worry about shrapnel coming out. We don't have to worry about know, anything like gas or like whatever, really. but always watching over back or, you know, as, as like a, an opposing enemy sniper or something like that taking off her head. But it was, um, it's something I enjoyed, especially on set, was I was always scanning the tree line. Like I was always trying to remain in character and trying to keep this, um, this mood um, that Francis would be in where he's scanning the tree line. He's, He's looking at his fellow soldiers, seeing if they're okay. Because there was days when it was really hot. Um, the heat, st the heat stress was was something that was a bit of a concern. But it was like, um, I just think everything added to the effect of of our set um, that contributed to this movie and helped helped our character a lot. Um, it really developed me as an actor um, as as well. And it sounds like you have a better appreciation of what um, those people in history actually went through um, the soldiers that were in the trenches that were doing these things that fought for things that they really believed in. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think we all came out with a, a deep um, respect for what they dealt with. But yeah, I mean, the reality is that there's, we still have Canadian soldiers deployed on peacekeeping missions and, and this, this hasn't changed. Right. And, but, but what has changed in a lot of cases, kind of like the public sentiment towards them, where we used to have as a culture, a thankfulness and a respect for soldiers that, that put themselves and put their futures on the line to, 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 to hold the line wherever in whatever part of the world that, that, that has issues that they're there to help. Um, it's not always the case anymore. We don't always treat them with the same level of respect but we should because they're dealing they, it's the same risk for them it's the same conditions they're dealing with so you, you see a uh someone who serves in the canadian armed forces uh the canadian military in general buy them lunch tell them thank you you know it's the, the little things that we can all do to show some gratitude for people that are defending our freedoms and the freedoms of others through the world every day and, and to this day and if I may, I think this film not only uh, awards recognition, not just to Francis Beckham McGabble, but to, you know, the Canadians in general. In all the history books and films I've seen in recently and, you know, in the past couple of years, there is rarely or sometimes no mention of all of Canada's involvement. I remember reading one book and it only mentions the British Empire. Not a single time is Canada brought up. Even the games I've played, they don't bring up Canada. They just bring up their rifles and such. So uh, this film is, you know, I feel like proud to be a Canadian after seeing this. And I think that Aaron has done all of Canada great service by, you know, acknowledging their contribution to the First World War. Well, and I think it's important that the film does bring attention to what Peggy did. I mean, you're talking about the third <clears throat> deadliest sniper in history. Well, the context of that is he was in World War One. He was yeah. in arguably more primitive uh, weapons than the other snipers that came after him. And yet he had this staggering contribution, not just in, in a kill count, but like, as you alluded to captures, he used to steal trinkets off the Germans, mess with them psychologically, things like this, that impact was massive. And he was doing it with world war one equipment. And I yeah, just find the next it two, um, most deadliest snipers were from world war two. So yeah. prior to world war two, Francis, uh, Pega McGabble was the sniper, like historically, he was just off the charts phenomenal. And, and I mean, that, yeah, the, that, that's that's yeah. a really important consideration because when 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 we consider the historical record in context, uh, we know that there are a lot of people that believe, for example, that some of the World War II counts were 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 not accurate. That there were, you know. Uh, that there were snipers that were used for propaganda and as a result their numbers were padded um we know that in world war one there's been um historians that disagree in terms of even some of some of the well-known 
Canadians like Billy Bishop, where, um, you know, some people, and, and this is something we explore in the film, the use of propaganda by the Canadian government to recruit and then kind of lifting Billy Bishop up as this um, uh, kind of example of a World War One hero, but not doing the same in Peggy's case. So you could make a case that Peggy, Peggy's 378 and 300 prisoners taken is most likely unpadded. That's, that's, those are real numbers. If anything, maybe things that he did weren't attributed to him. And um, we know at the time, uh, early in the war, the Canadian government wouldn't let um, Indigenous people enlist. They wouldn't let them volunteer. Uh, same thing with, um, with Black Canadians. They, they would go to enlist. They want to do their part. And uh, like Julian said, get the adventure of seeing the world and they wouldn't let them. And then conscription comes around in 1918 and, and, and my have things changed. And now they're conscripting uh, people regardless of, of, uh, of their heritage. So it's, it's a unique time, but I, I would argue, you know, like Peggy's numbers were probably kind of unpolished. And when we look at some of the really effective World War II snipers, not to take anything away from them, there's a pretty good chance that there's some some polishing and and uh, and uh, propaganda going on around a lot of those heroes as well. I think one of them, the second one is Russian, and the the top one is Swedish, I believe. So I <laughs> take that as well. <laughs> I think what's really impressive also is, you know, even for his time, Peggy was using a rifle that had been, you know, discarded by the Canadian military. They thought it was rubbish, at least in the trenches, because it jammed so frequently. And they had a point. It wasn't the rifle you'd want to serve to a bunch of regular infantrymen who had no experience. But it was perfect for a hunter and, you know, for an, and like Peggy, who, like, who liked going solo. So, you know, I guess it was sort of a, you know, a mixed bag, but it's like it just goes to show you how certain things you know like unique require unique skills and talent you know the rest of us using elite enfield rifles having better luck but mm -hmm. yeah so that that was also a kind of a challenging part is um getting the weapons right and so making sure that they're authentic to the period but not just that they're the right model for the right soldier and one of the really challenging ones was uh the scope that uh, when you look at the historical record, some people say Peggy used a scope and some people say he didn't. But the reality is that he sometimes used a scope. He'd go through these periods of time where he would say, OK, based on where I am, where our side is, where they are, the kind of threat that we're facing, he'd have a scope. And other times he would deem it as, um, you know, a disadvantage because they're in too close a contact. Um, but those scopes are very rare. And for it to be still exist and be in condition that it looks right there's no way you're going to run around a battlefield with that thing it, the the value of it is so high it would the risk would just be um too high so we had to actually get one created so there's there's a prop master out of toronto a guy named chris warlow with fantastic creations and he remade one we, we found a bunch of images uh, got him some dimensions and specs and uh, and he recreated one from scratch that we that we use for the film and um it, it's just those kinds of details where it's um if you don't get them right it's going to take people who know those those uh, world war one facts um right out of the film they, they're not going to be able to suspend disbelief so um we wanted it to be you know it's not gonna be perfect right where limited budgets limited time limited everything but uh, as close as we could get it to historical accuracy we we really wanted to to make every effort to do that it's pretty outstanding. Yeah, you know, that's stuff you don't think about at all. I wasn't thinking you, you're going to these extents, but yes, when you're committed to as much of realism as you can possibly get, but that's just insane to me. So you went to a prop master in Toronto to get a replica made for the film. And so how much work goes into a replica of something like that? How long did the prop master have to work on this one piece to just add a little bit of realism into yep. what you were shooting? It was about a month. Um, so wow. it uh, I actually I remember we, we were sitting there making a budget decision. We're like, OK, can we do do we go with the, uh, you know, this extra Vickers that will shoot blanks or do we go with the um, the the prop recreation for um, Peggy scope? You know, like which one is going to add more? Right. And it's like, oh, OK, well, we've already got this in a few different ways. So 
we have to get Peggy's weapon right. We've got to get his scope right. It's got to be historically accurate. And of course, it spends half the film mostly covered in burlap anyway. But um, for the for those tights, for the moments where you can see it, um, you know, there's going to be some military historians or or even um, uh, Canadian Armed Forces members that see it, and, and I'm sure appreciate that level of authenticity um, that that those details add. And the other pieces, you know, we we really feel like a big part of what we do with the history films is preserve the history. It's not just the story, it's the details of the history. And uh, because everything that we see from World War One paints our, our, uh, our uh, image of World War One, it, it impacts it in conscious and subconscious ways. And so the higher level of detail that we can get the better. So th that's also why we have advisors. So like Brian McInnes, who who was an advisor, uh, both on um, Peggy and then kind of helps us to make sure that we get the indigenous culture right to whatever degree we can as well. And Keenan's obviously extremely helpful with that also. Um, we also had military advisors. So Farron Whiteye, who is uh, was a Marine, he's a police chief now, and he's also indigenous. And so he was a, an advisor on the film. And Jack Huggett, who's a World War I uh, historian, as well as uh, uh, Tim Gillies, who um he's he runs a world war one troop out of chatham kent and in addition to being an advisor on the film to help us get the details right um do we have the parapet at the right slope come and take a look tim let us know what do we need to adjust what do we need to tweak um well that crater is too round it wouldn't be that perfect let's you know okay perfect appreciate it those kinds of notes and so um to get the details right but it can't it also can't be one person's perspective because each of us has bias so having enough advisors to to kind of get those details right and and then accept the you know um 90 10 rule i guess where you know you do something about the things you can and if it's uh, a low impact high cost uh detail have the uh you know have, i guess the the discernment to to let that one go and maybe it won't be noticeable and cross your fingers but um it, it just just an amazing amount of support that we had from world war one planes to military advisors to you know a direct descendant of peg and Magabo being willing to to help us shape the story and, and get it right it's um those are the kinds of things that really make a difference when you're when you're making a film on a shoestring budget um that that can make it have a, a much higher production value and and uh hopefully preserve the piece of history well yeah i think um Oh, sorry. No, go um, ahead. I think that um, for Francis, um, I just want to interject and kind of go over everything that you guys just talked about. My internet's getting really choppy here. I'm using my uh, my sister in law's uh, hotspot because we're at ceremonies, um, so there's no Wi-Fi around. So uh, forgive me if there's a little bit of distortion and um, choppy spots here. But I just wanted to touch on francis's record as a sniper and i just think that that's pretty incredible um which is something that really makes him who he is right um the legend that he is that he is as he has spoken of um and all the contributions that he he did for the war um and a lot of the the frontline spearheading um uh, is the tip of the spear um from the canadian infantry and soldiers um, and he he really looked out for his men he really did everything that he can he also would went out on his own solo missions because one of his spotters that he was with, he became really good friends with. And he, he went, turned over to his right to, to talk to him um, because his friend wasn't talking. And he had actually, uh, his friend was shot in the face. So after that, he, he just, he, he wanted to continue these, uh, these solo missions by himself. Another thing, um, uh, out of all this work that Francis did and, and the honor that he did for his, um, his people as well as Canada, I think one of the, the highlights that really isn't spoken about, but it's not to shame anyone, but it's 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 because we're in a place of learning and this is something that is being brought to light, was that Francis never, um, he never collected any, any pension or anything from the Canadian army um, after he served for his country. Um, so there was a lot of contributions that he did, but there was a lot of stuff that, as indigenous people um, that we don't get back in reciprocity as well, um, this, this, um, and this relationship. So there's a lot of um, stuff that probably um, most Canadians don't know about, and that's kind of being struck under the rug, but a lot of that um, has been coming to light uh, of recent events and stuff. Um, 
in this era, this time of learning. Um, and I think that's, um, there's a lot of allyship that, uh, that he showed and that he kind of put forward um, in hopes to um, get everyone else on board to what he was doing as well. I think that um, with the, with the, the level of uh, authenticity that was put into this movie, um, from the sniper rifle, his Ross rifle, his, his scope that he was using, um, yeah, I, I believe that is true. But I also believe that he would be using his iron sights as well in those close range quarters um, because some of these trenches were like like 10 feet away from each other. Um, so there was a lot of um, stress that would be put on um, and, and the amount of supplies that they had um, going on this night right to get more ammo from the enemy, but also like keeping the stuff that they had that was so valuable, such as a, as a sniper rifle scope, so that um, they wouldn't get in the hands of the Germans, and so that he would be able to do his his role uh, and continue his leadership and, and inspire his men to to continue to fight with him. I think that's really something that that really needs to be brought to light. But also, um, as an indigenous person, I know that because um, I'm the day one ceremony is at Kettle Point, um, a place where the military barracks was um, was put on to the indigenous land during the war acts effort. And that fight is still going on today to get our, our recognition um, for the contributions that we put forward and the sacrifices that we that we put forward for this country as well. Um, and it and you know it's kind of like all this um, contributions that we did, it, it's just it really kind of bothers me a bit when when you talk about how great of a warrior and how much of a hero he is, but it's pretty much just talk at this point because um, a lot of his family and a lot of the stuff that he did after he, he, he left the war, um, he wasn't recognized and now we're doing that honor to recognize him. So I think that's something that we should also not skip by uh, out, of, out of light. Um, and it's not to shame anyone, it's not to shame anything. It's just, it's a place of learning that we need to know and that's something that um, we need to do. And I think this is a big step forward um, in honoring Francis Pagamagabo of who he was and the contributions he did for the Canadian army as well. And I think it's also something that, that we should recognize today is that there are a lot of Indigenous people that have joined the military, the Canadian military. There are many serving members to this day from the Indigenous community that a lot of people don't seem to recognize either. And Francis was more than just a war hero. He was a community leader when he got back. He was very active in his community and speaking on behalf of Indigenous rights. So his story is more than just this movie in a sense too, but you're right. I, I'm glad that you did this, Aaron. And uh, I really hope that this brings some attention to this story because it is a, it should be a high point in Canadian history. It should be something that is celebrated all across this country. Yeah, we, we, we absolutely agree. Um, it, it's uh, Peg Magabo is a name that should be a household name in Canada. And, uh, and and isn't, you know, Bishop, you mentioned Billy Bishop, everyone knows who he is, 72 victories, um, you know, somewhat of a polished resume. Uh, Peggy Magabo, on the other hand, very few people have heard of, but it, I think it's also important, like Keenan mentioned, to recognize, like this was a time in, in, in World War One was a time in Canadian history where um, an Indigenous man like Francis Peggy Magabo couldn't even vote in, in government uh, elections and and it's easy for us to look back and think okay well you know well they we know better now that you know these are the kinds of things that happened 100 years ago but they're not the case now and, and i would strongly advocate not that much has changed and and when we, when we have a federal government that campaigned on ending drinking water advisories on um uh, in, in first nations communities and we still have 56 of them. Like he's been in power, what, seven years? And, yeah. and we still have those drinking water advisories. I, I think it's important to keep the conversation national to make sure that we're we're keeping our leaders honest to the commitments that they've made and making sure that they follow through on the commitments um, like we haven't always done in the past. And, and that's part of being good neighbors. We've certainly seen Peggy Magabo and others step up in times of need. And we'd like to see the government step up and keep their commitments to to indigenous peoples and our neighbors, um, you know, now. By all means. This movie, I think it's it's a, a wonderful tribute 
and a, a recognition of one section of our history, one small section. And hopefully it's something that will get people um, interested and excited again about Canadian history and the great things that have been done in the past. It's not all bad. There's a lot of good that was done and we just have to appreciate it. And we don't seem to be appreciating our history as much as we should. Yeah, and I, I think it's important that um, that people who who live the history or the effects of the history tell the stories as well. And so, um, you know, I, I think in a perfect world, there would be, uh, you know, a feature film that tells the story of Francis Pagamagabo's life from start to finish. We, we can't do that. It, we're telling a slice of the war. But I think that should happen. I think it should be told by an Indigenous voice, right, an Indigenous filmmaker. And, and that's why it's so important that we have um, diverse um, people telling stories that we won't otherwise hear. Um, when you look at when you look at uh, a lot of Canadian content, I, I think these days it's uh, focused around. You know, there's focus groups, I guess, that say what people are interested in, and I don't think that they're always accurate. But I, I do think that there is a sincere interest among the Canadian public for kind of um, gritty Canadian history told with you know the rough edges still on it, the way it happened. And, uh, and and so I, I think that there, there's an audience that that this film will find and hopefully it, it helps to shed some light on this little piece of of Canadian history that that otherwise might have been lost to time and and maybe start raising some of these questions getting conversations going um, around some of the issues that we're still dealing with today um, you know with just a lack of appreciation for for our uh, armed forces and uh, for our for our neighbors who you know, continue to step up and, and, uh, you know, are so patient with us, to be honest. Um, you know, as, as I talk to Keenan and Brian and others, um, it's, I, I'm, I'm just so impressed by the patience that they show and the grace that they show as a community, um, when they're dealing with the Canadian government and Canadian polity, it's, uh, they certainly have many, many instances where, things have not panned out and uh and and haven't been the way that it was described when when uh when deals are made and things so it's um I, I just appreciate how they uh kind of partnered with us to tell this piece of history and this story and uh hopefully we did it justice and speaking of the audience there's um obviously you're doing festival runs yeah, so uh, it's kind of the hurry up and wait game with uh, festivals, right? So, uh, you know, about six months before for the festival circuit kicks off, uh, we you start sending submissions. So we, we sent submissions to 30 or 40 festivals now. And uh, we're in that, you know, wait until uh, I think August, we'll start hearing back um, on what which ones it was a fit for and, and where it'll play. In addition to that, we've got, um, you know, kind of Ontario uh, we've got a tour of screenings, so 30 screenings in 16 cities between October 7th and November 12th. And um, so, as people are, you know, what what do we do to uh, to to teach our kids um, ahead of Remembrance Day? What do we do, um, you know, to kind of celebrate those moments ourselves, uh, the celebrate these sacrifices that previous generations have made, so that we can go to the movie theater? And I think when you look at some of what we dealt with over the last couple of years and some of the restrictions, it's easy to see how, um, you know, we can take our freedoms for granted sometimes. Something that seems as straightforward as being able to go to a movie theater and in some parts of the world and other points in history, they couldn't do that. And some of these freedoms that were protected um, by Canadian soldiers in the past and, uh, you know, that we don't take those for granted. So hopefully people can go find one of those uh, electricmotionpictures.com backslash screenings find one close to you, get some tickets, uh, talk to friends and family, get them to come as well, and uh, get some people out to see the film. Well, now, Aaron, uh, there's somebody here that lives in Saskabush. <laughs> and so how would someone like myself, who is not in Ontario, see this? Film? Is there going to be a digital release after you guys go through theaters uh, and festivals? Like, how would... I want all of Canada to be able to see this, not just Ontario. So... <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, for us, it, it's, uh, it's kind of walk before we run in terms of kind of trying to grow our audience from 
Like, I, I think at this point, we've got kind of a provincial audience for our films, and we're trying to grow it into a national audience. It's certainly a story that that applies to all of Canada. I think there's, you know, there's something there for everyone. And so we, uh, between festivals and, and some cities, some venues reaching out across the country, we're, we're trying to, you know, get more screenings kind of Canada-wide. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of people from Alberta reach out, another one from Saskatchewan reach out recently. And so then it, it becomes, can we, can we make it, a, uh, can we make it work? Is there a venue that, that will, that will fit and does the timing work and, you know, the dates available and all that. So still potential that there's more screenings across Canada between festivals and, and, and as part of our tour. Uh, but yeah, they'll absolutely be a release. Typically it's a few months after the film does kind of its festival run. Um, we release it on Blu-ray, DVD, digital download, digital rental. Uh, via Vimeo. So um, our our website has that for uh, kind of our first three films, electricmotionpictures.com. And uh, and then we'll, between there and social media, we'll, we'll let everybody know um, many, many times uh, as it becomes available in other formats after uh, after the theatrical run. But it's, it's definitely a film that if you get the opportunity to see it in theaters, uh, you know, between the performances and the stunts and just the scale uh, uh, of the film, it's... Uh, it, it's certainly worth the uh, the ticket fee to to be able to do that, and even even for the screenings that we're doing Q and As, and about half of the screenings we've got a planned cast or crew Q and A uh, in the city. A couple more that we've got virtual Q and As planned. So you know we'll talk about the movie, we'll talk about the history with the folks that are there, um, but uh, we we still keep the the ticket price you know competitive with if you go see any movie at your local theater. So it's. It's good value as well. We've seen, you know, indie productions that do the Q and A thing, and they, they charge many, many times more for the tickets for that. But we don't. We just we want it to be a film that's accessible for everyone. And so, um, you know, and and every cent that comes in on ticket sales just goes into making the next Canadian history film. So, uh, hopefully, people can, uh, you know, hit the share button, hit the like button as they see things come across social and. Um, coordinate uh, groups, you know, let people know, help us spread the word. And then just in closing here, as we close out, Julian, Keenan, if there's anything you wanted to add, um, something that stuck out to you during filming or something that you're happy or proud of in the film that you'd like to talk about, and we just leave the audience with that and we'll close out. Well, I got to say the final shot, not chronologically in terms of, but the final shot in the movie that we did where, uh, Am I allowed to talk about this? Are we doing spoilers? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe try not to reveal spoilers. Don't okay. tell them about the part where you fight I the won't. aliens. or uh, <laughs> I won't. But there will have the this one little part where we include part of Robert's Catholic heritage. And I think that moment right there was actually very important for me. I think it it was probably one of the most emotional moments. It also helped that it was a very quiet day. And uh, I think we could see a few birds hovering around the sky, and I think it really helps set the tone. I'm glad that Aaron agreed to that, that moment. I'm also just simply grateful for Aaron for giving me this opportunity to, you know, act in this film. This is the first uh, major film I've ever been in. And uh, I hope that thanks to Aaron, it'll help me get recognized, but also help other people get recognized as well. And I'm honored to work alongside Keenan, uh, Chris, Michael, Sam, and everyone else who was part of this. So, yeah, thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, I think um, I'd like to say thank you to Aaron as well, as especially to Divergent Media for uh, for taking this interview for us um, to help advertise and market this movie. I really hope that everyone um, will share this uh, Electric Motions Pictures link um, and check out their website as well. I I believe like I don't know if, I can't really put one particular point on when filming about uh, on, uh, portraying Francis. I think uh, from start to finish, a lot of like, um, especially because this was part of like one of my first leading kind of co-leading roles, that I, it was probably going to be one of the most memorable things I ever I will ever do um, in my career as acting. And there's still a lot more like there's still a lot more stuff I want to do as an actor as well. I've been talking to Aaron about projects um, that we're going to a little bit under under um, closed ears right now, but um, there are a lot of stuff that I still want to work on as well. Um, However, uh, right now I'm at ceremonies and I'll be leaving here on Sunday tomorrow. And I'll be traveling to Perry Sound and I'll be starting um, rehearsals uh, for this production called Sounding Thunder, The Sound of Francis Pegamagal. And I'm going to be playing Francis again 
in a live orchestra slash play. Um, so I'm going to be touring from Perry Sound. We're going to do uh, rehearsals from all week, from Monday to Saturday. Uh, we're going to do a performance at the Perry Island Public School. We're going to do one at the Stocky Center, where we're, we'll have a viewing of uh, the Ace and the Scout um, later on in, the, in November. And then from there, I'm going to be traveling to Ottawa um, to perform, and then we will travel to Kingston and then Stratford is going to be the end of this tour. Um, so I'm going to be on the road a lot, but um, this is something that I enjoy and I love. And it's just, I don't know, everything just keeps getting better and better uh, ever since I started filming this movie with Aaron. So I'd like to thank Aaron as well for giving me this opportunity. Um, and this is, uh, this is really set um, the motion forward and, and a lot of my, uh, and a lot of my career. And it's been, it's been um, pretty life changing because during COVID, it was everything started to look glim. I was going through a bad depression. I had lost a, a friend to uh, a lot of childhood friends, so it already felt like I was I was going through this this type of war of loss and grief, and having to push forward and continue um, and try and see the the brighter side of things and um, coming through this tunnel um, and coming out and seeing a victory in the end um, and and not giving up. And just just continuing to uh, to thank uh, the God or slash Creator um, for everything that He's put forward in my life, um, whether it be good or bad. Because um, during the bad times, that's when you develop yourself as a character. That's when that's when you, you become thankful for all the things that you are given, and you you appreciate them. So that's just one thing I wanted to um, to mention um, before we close off here. Well, thanks for sharing. I'm sorry for your loss and. Thank you for your committing, both of you, Julian and, and Keenan, to what you did. It's not easy to put yourself in a role to truly try to encapsulate a piece of history. And thank you, Aaron, for taking that on and putting this movie out there. We hope that people will go out to see Ace and the Scout. I hope I can see it soon. So I look forward to uh, seeing it out here in Saskatchewan. But in Ontario, there will be screenings. Look for those here in Ontario. And is there anything you wanted to add, Jilly, before we close out here? Just thank you all for coming on and, and telling us about the creation of a film in very difficult times and such a, an important film to get out there and uh, for people to see. As far as I'm concerned, it should be part of the school curriculum, but you know, that's just me. <laughs> so thank right. you for being with us. Thanks for joining us and everyone. Thank you. Until next time, keep an eye for Ace and the Scout coming out in October of this year.